Father, I just pray, Holy Spirit, would you speak to us? Each person here in a language that we understand this morning, God, open our eyes to see something new. Open our ears to hear what you want to say to us this morning. That's what matters. It's your word. It's not mine. It's whatever you're speaking, whatever the Holy Spirit says. That's what makes a difference. That's what shifts and change and grows us, Lord. So, Father, let us hear what the Spirit would say to us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Many, many years ago, and now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share something with you that I don't want repeated anywhere, okay? I've only shared this with a couple of the closest people in my life. I'm going to bear my soul to you this morning. Many, many years ago, my first ever overseas trip, I'd never been overseas. I got saved at 19, came to faith at 19. Uh, about a year later, I find myself in this. Six months later, I'm in this organization called Youth of the Mission. Three months after joining that, I'm on a plane flying overseas for the first time. I'd, I'd only ever crossed the border from New South Wales to Queensland previous to that. That was it, and that was pretty much once for a football trip, and the second time was to move up to YWAM. Other than that, I'd never been out of New South Wales. Here I am on a plane flying overseas uh, to another country. One of the places we went to was Malaysia, and we're in Malaysia one morning, and we go to this little church that we're ministering. Would have been, when I say little, probably a couple of hundred people in this church in Malaysia. And uh, I'm, we're sitting up the front, the team's up the front, and we're all sitting here, and there's worship on. And I think they were singing, remember that old song, Majesty? Majesty. Yeah, they were singing that song, I remember it. And they're singing Majesty, and all of a sudden, I had this majestic feeling in my belly. It was new food, I hadn't eaten a lot of that stuff before. And I realized, oh, geez, I need to majestically make my way out of this auditorium and find myself a lavatory and so I did I kind of everyone's hands are in the air and so on I took off down the aisle and went out the back and ran into the men's room and I'm why do they call it a restroom by the way that bugs me you're not resting in there are you really but anyway um I, I, I'm sitting in there and I'm, I, I sat down and I did what I needed to do and then I, I reached up to grab the, the toilet paper as we would in our country and there was none there, no paper. And so I'm sort of looking around, you know, if it's not on the hanger, maybe it's sitting on the system, it's not there, maybe it's on the window ledge. And I'm looking around, there's, there's, there's no, no paper anywhere, I, I, I can't find anything. And of course, I'm in a church service, we're about to start ministering to these people and so on. So I, I didn't know what to do, so uh, the most gracious way I could, I kind of got redressed and waddled to the door and opened the door and, and the toilet was, there was a crash. And where the crash was, then the toilet door. So I opened the door, and I, I'm trying to say to these people there, uh, have you got toilet paper? I'm trying to mimic whatever I could to say toilet paper, you know? And the problem was, this particular church, A, it was Chinese-speaking church. They only spoke Chinese. And the second problem is they were also deaf. It was a deaf Chinese-speaking <laughs> church. So I'm at the door almost in tears, begging these people, do you have paper? I need paper, you know? They can't understand me because I'm speaking English and they can't hear me because I'm deaf. I had no chance whatsoever. I felt so misunderstood. I felt like nobody cared. None of those people in that crash looking at me had a clue about the intense pain and struggle I was going through in that moment. And so I had to close the door, go back in, sit down. I finished what I'd started, and the only thing I could do is I happened to be wearing two socks that particular day. So I undid my laces, I took my shoes off, removed one of my socks, asked for forgiveness, did with the sock what you would normally do with paper, and then I realized, well, you can't flush a sock. So what am I going to do now with the sock? So after I'd sort of pulled myself together, I looked around thinking there's no bin, there's nothing, what are you? And I looked above the toilet, there's a tiny little window about that big. So I peeled open the louvers and I threw the sock outside the window. Now I just hoped that the pastor's car was not parked there. I didn't even want to look. Once I threw it out, I had all these things going, what could be happening out there, I don't know, but I didn't want to look. I just took off and I got out of that place as quickly as I possibly could. It didn't matter what I did to these people in that crash. I couldn't seem to get their attention, and I knew they didn't understand what I was going through. They didn't understand the pain and what was going on in my world in that moment. My question this morning, has anyone ever felt that way in life? Probably a different circumstance, but maybe you understand what I'm trying to say. You ever think that you're going through whatever you're going through, and you're going through it alone? Ever feel like even God himself is not interested in you in those moments? That for whatever reason, he's turned his back on you, and he's left you, and now all of a sudden you've got to fend for yourself. 
I'd be pretty fair to say that we've probably all felt that way before at some point in our life. And maybe there are some people here this morning and you're actually feeling that way right now. Here's what I know about Christmas. I read recently, somebody put it this way, Christmas is the big magnifier. It's the big magnifier. If things are really good in your life, Christmas time they feel even better. When things aren't really good in your life, they feel even worse. It's like Christmas this season shines a magnifying glass on the circumstances and situations that we're in. Family relationships, if they're not good, there's something about Christmas that makes them feel a whole lot worse. If they're really, really good, something about Christmas makes them feel even better. Christmas is like this big magnifier. And I think all of us have felt that way before, that we were going through things and we were the only one that knew about it. And maybe for whatever reason, I don't know why, maybe I feel like I didn't perform good enough. Maybe I feel like I fell short. Maybe I feel like, maybe some of us feel like we deserve it. But for whatever reason, I feel like God's not interested and he's not looking at me in this moment. Even the nation of Israel at one point felt this on several occasions. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 40, I want to have a quick look at Isaiah chapter 40. The nation of Israel in the Old Covenant was God's chosen people. God chose that nation for a purpose and for a reason, for a season. And at this particular time when Isaiah writes this, the nation of Israel are living in exile. They've been taken away from their homeland, away from their familiar surroundings, and they're basically living as captives in another place. And Isaiah writes to them in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 26 to 31. I just want to float a few thoughts at you this morning. Isaiah 40, verse 26 to 31. Isaiah writes this. He says to them, lift up your eyes. He's speaking to the people. He says, lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. He says, who created all these? He who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Think about that. God called the stars by name. We're still trying to discover stars and name them. Yet, yet Isaiah is saying here, God has such an intricate understanding of the universe and the world around us that he's, he's got names. He names all the starry hosts, all the stars in the sky. He calls forth each one of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Not one of them is missing. In other words, when something's missing, it usually means that you can't see it, right? If something's missing, it means that you, don't, you no longer have your eyes on that thing. You don't know where it is. He says, you know what? Nothing's missing in the sight of God. At no point does God take his eyes off. At no point is God not looking. At no point is God not aware. Even, even to you, Israel, who are in captivity, living in a foreign land under oppression, even to you right now with the circumstance you're going through, he says, God has not taken his eyes off you. You're not missing in the eyes of God. That can be hard to grab a hold of, especially for raving Pentecostals who believe that you know, life should all be beer and skittles as soon as you come to faith and everything's great. And, you know. But we all still go through those moments and those seasons of life. He says not one of them is missing. And then he goes, right, now we're going to stop talking about the stars. Now I'm going to bring it down to a human level. I'm going to talk to you as people. And the very next verse, why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God. Ever feel that way? I know this. God might not see things the way I do, but I know that he sees everything. He might not feel the same way I do about what's happening in my life, but I know that he feels about what's happening in my life. And he might not share my answer to the things I'm going through, but I know that God has answers for me. I know that he does. Because I know I'm not hidden from him. I know that he hasn't lost sight of me. I know that he's with me. I know that he sees me. I know that he knows what's going on in my world. And verse 28, do you not know? Have you not heard? Now we're going into a very famous, well-known passage. If you've been around church for a while, you know this one. He says, do you not know? Have you not heard? What he's really saying is, you know, but you've forgotten. So I'm going to remind you. You've heard this before, but you've forgotten. So I'm going to remind you. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He'll not grow tired or weary. Anyone ever get tired and weary, keeping an eye on their own children? We had four kids. I can tell you what, I got tired and weary just trying to keep up with four kids and what was going on in their world. But God is beyond time and space. He says that God doesn't grow tired and weary like you or I do. You know, those moments where you go, ah, oh, that, that, that's just getting too hard over there, so I'll take my eyes off that one for the sake of it. God doesn't do that. He's got his eyes and his attention is fixed upon us. And his understanding, no one can fathom. And then it says this, he gives strength to the weary, increases the power of the weak. Even young people grow tired and weary, 
And young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not faint. You see, God saw Israel even when they were in captivity and they were crying out for a saviour, somebody to deliver them. In the midst of that depth of darkness and struggle, God was still present. God was with them. And God was aware, even though they didn't feel like it. See, God saw Israel in the midst of their captivity. God saw Moses. Moses was roaming around in a desert herding sheep. Remember the story of Moses? He, he, he's, he's brought up in Egypt and he's, he's doing pretty good. He's up there. He's the son of Pharaoh. And then he sees one of his own Israel, uh, Israeli people getting beaten by this Egyptian. So he steps in and he kills the Egyptian, thinking that the, the, the Israelites would then go, here's the saviour, here's the one, and follow him and he'd lead them out. Instead, they turned on him the next day and said, you're going to come and kill us too like you did the Egyptian. They didn't get it. So Moses takes off and he's wandering around in a desert. I can imagine what's going on in Moses. I thought I heard you, God. I thought I heard you say to me that I was going to be the deliverer. I thought I knew the plan of God for my life, the purpose of God for my life. I, I stepped into it. I thought I was doing the right thing. And bang, here I am now, wandering around in a desert. And God saw Moses roaming around in the desert, herding sheep, thinking it was all over and thinking he'd blown it by killing this Egyptian. God saw Gideon. Gideon was scared, hiding in a wine press for fear of being invaded by the Midianites. He's in a wine press, a hole in the ground, uh, uh, threshing wheat when he should have been out in the open, throwing the wheat in the air, the wind blows away the chaff and stuff. But he's hiding in fear, but God came to him and God saw him in the midst of his fear. God saw Hagar. Abraham's Egyptian slave. In Genesis chapter 16, we read the story that Abraham's married to Sarai. Sarai can't have a child. So Sarai says to Abram, why don't you take uh, Hagar, the, the servant, the slave, why don't you sleep with her and she'll produce a child and then that way we can have a child because I can't have children. And so Abram does exactly what Sarai says to do. And then when the child is born, Sarai gets filthy mad at Hagar. And makes her life a living hell to the point where Hagar takes off and runs and flees. And God saw Hagar and comes to Hagar. In fact, in Genesis 16 verse 13, Hagar's response to God when God turned up, she says this. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have seen the one who sees me. God sees you in the depths of those moments, in the the biggest of struggles, the the darkest of times in our life. God saw Job in the midst of his questions and his confusion. His children uh, are dead. He's lost his business and so on. He's got these people around him saying, curse God and die. And in the midst of the questions and the confusion, God saw Job. God saw Job. God saw Elijah when he fled Jezebel after his great victory. Remember that? Elijah gets the prophets of Baal together and we have the prophets of Baal dance around the, the sacrifice and so on. And, 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 and Elijah says, look, the God who answers by fire, he's the real God. You go over there, kill the cows, do what you want. You dance around, do your stuff, see if your God listens. And then when you're finished and it doesn't work, I'll call upon my God and whichever God answers, he's the real God. And they danced around night and day and did all kinds of things and God didn't turn up and Elijah goes, right here now, here's the real God, Yahweh. God, there's a sacrifice, do it, bang. All these prophets are sacrificed and dealt with and you would think in the midst of this great revival, what a great high, but Jezebel comes after him. It's amazing how when we have really big high victories in life, usually they're followed by deep, dark challenges, aren't they? We never stay on the mountain, we don't live on top of the mountain our whole life. Matter of fact, the higher you go, the the deeper down the depths seem to be, this contrast. But God found Elijah, he took off and he ran, and God found him. God found me on a roundabout at 19 years of age. And he found you somewhere at some point in your life as well. In fact, Proverbs 15 verse 3 tells us this, The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere. Think about that. Everywhere. And he's not just watching the good. He says he's watching the wicked too. He's not just got his eyes on those that are sitting in a church on a Sunday morning because he doesn't just love them. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Not God so loved the church. God so loved the world. And when the world responds to the love of God, God builds the church. But his love is for the world. The starting point is the world. 
And it says here that his eyes are not just on the, the good, but they're on those who are not so good as well because he loves them like a good parent and he cares for them. The eyes of God are everywhere. The eyes of God are here upon us right now, meeting in this building. The eyes of God are upon us when we leave this room and there's no other Christians around. And we're watching TV or sitting in the front of our computers. Or we're out there doing our deals at work or whatever. God's eyes are upon us all the time. All the time. All the time. Now through these gifts that we get to give to Casper, we hope that they communicate to the children on our part that it's our little way of contributing with what you guys are already doing. It's saying, you know, you're not invisible. Somebody sees you. You matter. You're important. Not necessarily because of what you do, but because of who you are. You are human beings made in the image of God. This is what I believe as a Christian. You are human beings made in the image of God, loved by God, seen by God, and so valuable that he would send the greatest gift ever, the only gift that truly keeps on giving. Ever hear that saying, or oh, the gift that keeps on giving? You see it in advertisements? No, it doesn't. <laughs> at some point, the batteries die. At some point, the wheel falls off. At some point, you know... But somebody mentioned this morning, might have been Rob in your communion talk, that the sacrifice, the gift of Jesus is truly the only ever gift that literally keeps on giving. It hasn't been watered down. The potency of that sacrifice has not been watered down in the eyes of God. God's not getting to the point where he's going, well, the bucket's full, there's none left for you now. Let's dilute it a little bit. Anyone ever, ever you, you know, some of you, I'm sure you've done this, you've got the orange juice when you were a kid and you drink it. And then, you know, it, it's coming down too far because you drank too much, so you add water to it. So, look, you know, and you just dilute it and dilute it and dilute it till eventually mum and dad go, this orange juice is clear. What happened? <laughs> well, I haven't touched it. It wasn't me. It doesn't dilute down. The gift of Jesus is genuinely the gift that keeps on giving. We're about to celebrate Christmas. Now, here's the thing I was thinking about this morning. You know, firstly, there's not many people whose birthdays continue to be celebrated for 2,000 years. I can't think of anybody else, really. That's a long birthday. <laughs> I'm going to die one day. I'm going to leave this Adonis-like body of mine, and I'm going to go to be... <laughs> Don't laugh. It's not how you see me. It's how I see myself. <laughs> Some dreams are worth fighting for, Owen. But one day I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disappear. I'm going to... Leave this tent, Paul says, and I'm going to go and be with the Lord. And you know what? My, 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 maybe my wife and kids, if they're still around, maybe they will still celebrate my birthday for a bit. But I've got a pretty good idea that come my grandkids or great-grandkids, at some point they're going to stop celebrating my birth. Matter of fact, what happens with most people is we celebrate their birthdays. Then when they pass, we generally tend to remember more the day they passed than the day they were born. And then after a period, that too disappears. But we have this man here, Jesus Christ, for 2,000 years we've celebrated the day that he was born and we also celebrate the day that he dies, Christmas and Easter. That's pretty radical. That tells me something. If you're here and you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you've got to believe Jesus was human and that he was some person of significance, even if just based on that alone. So check out Jesus. Read a bit more about Jesus. Ask some people that know Jesus a little bit more about Don't go to Dr. Google. Don't go to Google to find stuff. Go and talk to other Christians if you want to know more. But that alone tells me there's something really important, special and precious about the person of Jesus because there's not many people I know, I don't know anybody, where we're still 2,000 years later celebrating his birth and his death. And his death. And people who don't even believe in him are happy to take the holiday. When Jesus comes on the scene, the children of Israel have had about 400 years of relative silence. From the end of Malachi to the beginning of Matthew, there's about 400 years where it feels like and looks like that God's not saying much, God's not doing much, there's not a lot of stuff happening. 400 years. I don't know what you're going through right now, but how long has it been between the last mountaintop? A month? A year? Two years? Five years? When was the last time you really felt that, that God was watching you and looking at you and was hearing your prayer? When was that last moment? It, it, it could, you go back 20 years. Tell me it was 20 years ago. We're talking 400 years. So we're talking generation after generation, eventually getting to the point where a generation goes, we believe that Yahweh is there, but I can't really give you much more than what the writings say because we haven't seen much activity from him. 
for the last two, three hundred years. Your grandparents didn't, your great grandparents didn't, and your great 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 grandparents didn't, but we know, because we've got these ancient documents, the Old Testament, we know that he's there, and we're believing that one day he's going to come and he's going to help us. 400 years of relative silence. And the gift of Jesus was the Father's way of saying to Israel again, and not just Israel, but to all humanity, no matter where you are, no matter what you're going through, no matter how you feel about yourself or what you have done, you are not invisible. You're not invisible. I see you. I understand what you're going through. And I'm actually here with you. I'm actually here with you. In fact, Isaiah prophesied in between uh, 706 80 AD, a long time before the birth of Jesus. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, Isaiah prophesied this. He said, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Matthew goes back to this because Matthew sees the connection between the birth of Jesus and this scripture. And in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, Matthew says this. He quotes it. He says, The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they'll call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God with us. Doesn't matter how we feel. Doesn't matter what we're thinking, how we feel about ourselves. The fact is that when Jesus came, that gift of Jesus was given uh, down here to planet Earth. It was God's way of saying again to humanity, I just want to remind you. Have you not heard? I know you've heard, but I just want to remind you. Have you not seen? I know you've seen, but I just want to remind you, God is with us. God is with us. Right now, God is here with us. The writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews 13, verse 5, he makes this statement. He says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Why? He says, because God has said this to you. He says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. What's he saying? He's saying this in a nutshell. Don't put your trust and hope in things that are here today, gone tomorrow. Here today, gone tomorrow. Don't put your faith and your trust in things that are here today and gone tomorrow. Why? Why? Because God is the only thing that is guaranteed to be there tomorrow. God is the only thing that is guaranteed in your life to still be there for you tomorrow. Nothing else is a guarantee in life except for God himself. God himself. And if that means that God is guaranteed to be there with me tomorrow, guess what happens when I get there tomorrow, no matter how I feel? Yesterday, I I knew that he was going to be there that day. So when I hear, God, when I hear that, that, that God is there tomorrow, that doesn't mean that every day I go tomorrow like the carrot on the stick in front of the donkey that's constantly there. No, no, today is yesterday's tomorrow. And God is here with me right now. And God is here with you right now, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing. No matter when the last time you heard, the last time you felt you saw, God is with you in the midst of whatever it is that you're going through. And that's the reminder when we, next week we're going to celebrate this great gift of Jesus to the earth. Emmanuel, God is with us. 400 years of silence after 400 years, God says, I just want to remind you I am with you. I'm with you no matter what you're facing and I'm with you no matter what you're going through. He will never leave you and he will never ever forsake you. And because of that, don't put your faith in anything else that's not guaranteed to be there. Several years ago, I was going through a really, really hard time. I've shared this story before, a few years ago. I was going through a really, really hard time. I I was facing some stuff in life and I didn't know where God was. It was one of those seasons in life where I literally felt invisible to God. I felt like, God, I've been serving you and giving you the best of my life and I'm doing what I believe you've called me to do and I believe I'm doing it in the way you've called me to do it and so on, but I've got this going on and that going on and people misunderstanding me and people mad at me and all kinds of stuff's happening all around me, God, but I, 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 I believe I'm being faithful. I believe I'm doing what you've called me to do. But I'm not getting a single feeling. I'm not hearing nothing. If I'm going on feelings and hearing, I almost feel like I'm a million miles away to you, God. You've covered your eyes. You've looked the other way and you don't care about me. That's how I actually feel right now, God. And it just feels so unfair. And one day, I, this was back when we were living in YWAM, and one day I came home from the base and I, I came uh, home and Jackie, we had uh, the three boys at the time, little, they were small. And I walked into the kitchen and I said to Jackie, she's busy trying to get dinner and the kids are running around to feet in the kitchen. So I said to her, do you want me to take the, the boys down to the park? There's a park around the corner and we'll go and play and that way you can cook dinner without the kids running in and out. How many mothers would love that? Good idea, yep, nailed it again, Dad. I certainly didn't nail it all the time, I'll tell you. But this was a good day. 
So I took the kids down to this park, and we're sitting down at the park, and we are playing. Uh, there's a, now, now, in this park, you've got to keep in mind, there's a, a slippery dip, a swing, and a tree. That's all that's in this park, just a big open flat. There's one tree, a slippery dip, and a swing. And so I get to this park, and we're playing and so on, and I look at my watch, and go, look, it's probably about time to go back home now. Mum's probably got dinner ready, so come on, kids, let's go. And so they go, no, Dad, we don't want to go yet. We want to play hide and seek. I'm looking, going, there's a slippery dip, there's a swing, and there's a tree. And I'm thinking, kids, can you see what I'm seeing? Like, do you understand why that sounds stupid? There's a slippery dip, and the slippery dip had the metal, you know, not the child safe ones now with the protective bars around them and the cushioning at the bottom. It's just the good old fashioned steel ones. The kids climbed up, fell backwards, and broke their arms. Remember those ones? Or you slid down them and they were like 45 degrees and by the time you got to the bottom, third degree burns all up the backside. Remember those slippery dips? Yep, it'd be worth a mint now because you can't get them anymore, they're illegal. But back then when parks were like minefields and kids loved them, and that's why boys loved them anyway. And so I said, right, yeah, no worries. Well, let's play hide and seek then, you know. There's a slippery dip, a swing and a tree. That's it. I said, okay, guys. And they said, great. Um, uh, Dad, we're going to go and hide now. Dad, you go and count to 100. Fair enough. So I close my eyes and I go, one, two, three, four, right through, 98, 99, 100. Ready or not, here I come. And I opened up my eyes. And when I opened up my eyes and looked around, there was still a slippery dip, a swing and one tree. That's it. So I'm standing there going, well, obviously, you know, they're not going to be behind the little rungs of the slippery dip. And, and the swing, it's just two chains with a piece of rubber. Obviously, they've got to be behind the tree. It had a little bit of covering and so on. But I thought, oh, I'm a good dad. I'll, I'll have some fun with them. We'll make this a fun day, you know? So I, I open my eyes and go, I wonder where they could be. And I hear the kids behind the tree going, oh, dad's an idiot. Oh. And I thought, okay, we'll have some fun. I walked over and said, I wonder if they're behind the slippery dip. And I jumped behind the metal rod and, oh, they're not there. And they're over there going, oh. I wonder if they're under the swing. And I lifted up the rubber and the kids are there going, oh. Not there. So I wonder if they're in the grass. So I'm crawling around the grass and the kids are cackling oh, behind the thing thinking, Dad is a clown. He's got nothing. Why do we even listen to him? And I'm thinking similar things too, thinking, God, where have I failed my kids that they thought this was a good game to play with a slippery dip, a swing and a tree? Anyway, eventually, I stood up and I'm looking around and go, I wonder if they're behind the tree and I jumped behind the tree and I went, ah, and the kids went, ah, we rolled around in the grass and had a good time and laughed and so on. And then we jumped up and I brushed the grass off myself and off the kids said, right, yeah, guys, come, we've got to go home now. Mum's got dinner ready. And the boys said, no, Dad. It's our turn now. You've got to hide. <laughs> what have I done wrong? You've got to hide, Dad, and we'll count to 100. <sighs> okay. So they start counting. 99, 44, 21, 66, 99, however. And of course, I've got three options, haven't I? Slip a dip, a swing, or a tree. So I chose the right one. I went and hid behind the tree. So they opened up their eyes, and they did the same thing. I don't know why, I've never really spoke to them about it, but as soon as they open up their eyes, they're looking around like this, like a deer in headlights. <gasps> one jumps behind the slippery dip pole and goes, he's not there. Another one runs over to the swing and picks it up and goes, he's not there. Then they're crawling around in the grass, he's not there. Now I thought at that point, now you're going to come behind the tree, right? Because that would be the common sense thing to do. But they didn't. They start scratching around and looking further into the grass and then checking behind the slippery dip and on the top. And, it, and they're doing this, they're going, Daddy! 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 But it changed. There was a moment. Daddy! Daddy! Daddy? Dad? 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 I could tell in their tone. They were starting to get afraid, fearful. Where was Dad? As soon as I heard the tone change and I saw that, no, they're actually genuinely worried that I'm not here, that I'm not watching, that I'm not with them. So from behind the tree, I made my best chicken noise. <coughs> Rooster, whatever you call it. And they went, oh, maybe he's behind the tree. And I'm thinking, you reckon? So they come running behind the tree and they went, ah! 
ah! And I went, ah! We rolled around in the grass and had a good time. We got up, we brushed the grass. I said, now, come on, boys, we've got to go home now. Dinner's going to be ready. And they went, yeah, no worries. So I remember walking. Caleb was the oldest, and Caleb was standing uh, there, and I had the other two, Johnny and Jordan. And I'm holding their hands, and we're walking along. And Caleb just turns to me as we're walking back to the house. He says, Dad, I was really, really scared because I couldn't see you. And without even thinking, what came out of my mouth was, it doesn't matter that you couldn't see me, son. I could see you. And in that moment, I felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, Alan, that's faith. It's not that you can always see me. It's not that you hold me in the palm of your hand. It's believing that I hold you in the palm of mine. It's knowing that even when you can't see me, I'll never take my eyes off you. I'll never take my eyes off you. I'm the God who sees you. No matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through this morning, let me encourage you by telling you God sees you. I don't care how far away from him you feel, God sees you. I don't care what you've done, God sees you. I don't care what you think about God. God sees you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. His eyes are on the righteous and the unrighteous. The good, the bad, and the ugly. If I can use an old Western term. God's there. But like every gift, the gift of Jesus needs to be received. It needs to be received. And so many of us hear about this gift year after year after year, whether you walk into a church, whether you see it on TV, you hear it in a song. We hear about this gift every year, the gift of Jesus that's given to us. It's not enough to hear about the gift of Jesus. I've got an Uncle Bill. And Uncle Bill, one year, he came to a family gathering and I remember when he left, he got all these Christmas gifts. And I remember the boot being opened up when he left and I remember walking with my Uncle Bill because I kind of idolised Uncle Bill. And he took these gifts and he put them in the boot of his canary yellow Corona that he had. Corolla, sorry, Corona, Corolla. (laughs) And you know what happened 12 months later? I don't remember how it happened, but somehow we connected with Uncle Bill somewhere at another event 12 months later. And I remember being excited when he arrived. I ran downstairs to help get the, the bags out of the boot of the car. And when the boot popped, you know what was in there? Same gifts, unwrapped. He hadn't even looked at them. I wonder how many people do that with Jesus every year. The gift is there, it's given to you. But you've got to receive it. You've got to take it on board. What will you do this year with that gift of Jesus? Let me tell you, he sees you. No matter how you're feeling, no matter what's going on, God is there for you. And you don't have to put your hand up in a church service and come down the front crying, saying, oh Lord, forgive me. All you've got to do is open your heart to the possibility of the reality of God. All you've got to do is in your own way cry out to him and say, God, are you there? because I sure could do with some help. It would be great to know, God, that while nobody else might see me, that you're there and that you do, and that you know what's going on in my life. Father, I want to thank you for your word, God. I want to thank you for this amazing season, God, of Christmas, but we also acknowledge it is, it is the great magnifier. And Lord, there are, there are people in this room, and Christmas is not necessarily the greatest season of the year for them. And Lord, there are people in this room, God, and if we feel distanced from you, if we feel like you're not looking at us, if we feel like you're not interested, God, then all this talk about your birth, God, it can really magnify the fact that we feel so alienated from that baby in that manger. But Father, the truth is that we're not. And God, you're here with us, that you see us and that you love us, Father. And so Lord, I want to pray for each person here, God. I pray as this Christmas season comes, And as it leaves, God, of all the gifts that we get this year, God, let the greatest gift be uh, an understanding that God is with us, that you will never leave us and you'll never forsake us, Father. And God, if there are people in this room that don't know that, my prayer, God, our prayer this morning, let them know it. Let them know it. Holy Spirit, if you are juggling around, jingling around inside people's spirits right now, Father, getting their attention, I pray, Father, show them Jesus. Show them Jesus. And God, I ask this this morning in your name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen.
Amen, amen. Awesome. Hey, look, if you're here this morning, and uh, I don't know everybody here, but look, if you don't, if you've got questions about Jesus and questions about Christmas and what it's all about and so on, hey, why don't you grab somebody uh, and ask them a few questions. Maybe you're here and you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you're not sure if you believe. Why don't you grab someone that does and say, hey, why don't you tell me, why do you do this? Why do you think Jesus is real? What's happened in your life and so on? And just ask some questions, get some questions answered. If you are a believer in Jesus here and maybe you've got some stuff going on, why don't you turn to somebody next to you and go, you know what, I kind of relate to that. I feel like I've got this stuff going on I think nobody sees, but I know now that God does, would you pray for me this morning? I'm sure there are needs and things in here and we believe in the power of prayer. Why don't we pray for one another, be the church to one another this morning, amen?